Hey everyone, welcome back to Playing Quietly. My name is Ryan, and today I'm bringing you another Remnant 2 guide. Today we're going to be talking about the build that carried me through Apocalypse Difficulty. But before we get into any of that, I want to make sure that all credit for the framework of this build goes to a channel called Vash, I think it's pronounced Kawai. Uh, I'll have a link to his channel in the description below. Um, but I just want to make sure I give credit where credit is due. He does a fantastic job of laying out why builds work on paper. He also has an awesome tool that'll help you with your build guides linked on his channel. Anyway, if you guys haven't already, go check out his channel and subscribe. But my build does differ in a few key ways. On to the second point. This build is not meant to face tank every single hit that a boss is going to throw at you. It will be able to tank a majority of the hits, but not every hit. There are going to be the big giant uh, one shots that are still going to probably kill you. The purpose of this build, like I said, is not to face tank everything. It is to get you better at playing the game. So in the build that a lot of people have probably seen and is definitely the tankiest build on paper. That is undisputed. The, the build that is on Vash's page, it is meant to tank everything and it will. It's fantastic at doing that, but the goal of this build isn't to do that. Again, it's to get you better at playing the game. So the key difference is going to lie in our relic and some of the other pieces we're using in our jewelry slots. So let's take a look at the build now. So first of all, we're going to be running Medic in our primary archetype slot. We're going to be doing this to get the Regenerator Prime perk. With Regenerator, the more we heal ourselves, the more relics we're going to be getting back. And in our secondary slot, we're going to be using Summoner, and I recommend using the flyers for our minions. Over in our armor slots, we're going to be running Leto Mark II for our helm, chest, and legs. And in the glove slot, we're going to be running the Labyrinth Gauntlets. Altogether, that is going to give us 363 armor when we take some of our traits into account. Where my build differs greatly from some other builds, we are going to be running Resonating Heart. So let's take a look at what Resonating Heart actually does. On use, we're going to be regenerating a certain percentage of our health based on all of our equipment. For me, it's going to be 57.5% of our maximum health over 5 seconds. When the heal ends after that 5 seconds, any overhealed health is doubled and awarded over the next 20 seconds. So the basics of what we're going to be doing is we can either preemptively pop our resonating heart and in anticipation of taking some damage, or we can take it reactively. Then what I recommend doing is taking another resonating heart, and we're going to have a huge health pool that is going to be ticking down over that 20 seconds. So any other damage that we take during that 20 seconds is going to be almost instantly healed by our resonating heart. And because of our perk that we're getting from Medic, those relics are going to be regenerating themselves. And because of some traits that we're going to be taking, our minions are also going to be taking some of that damage for us. In our relic fragment slots, we're going to be running health effectiveness, health, and armor effectiveness. This is just going to make us that much more tanky for if we do happen to take those hits. In our weapon slots, they don't really matter all that much. Um, I do recommend finding something that works well for you that has two open slots. In my initial clear of Apocalypse difficulty, I was running the Bone Saw, but I have since found a lot of love for the Black Maw. In the mod slot, I like to run Hotshot. Uh, for a number of reasons. Number one, I just really like running dot damage, and when we pop hot shot, it is going to automatically reload our weapon for us. This obviously has a much more valuable effect on something like the Bone Saw, but it also doesn't hurt with the Black Maw. In our Mutator slot, I like to run Twisting Wounds. Twisting Wounds is going to 
increase range damage of this weapon by 20% to bleeding targets. And at level 10, this weapon is going to make targets bleed when we crit them or hit them in their weak spot. So again, we're going to be critting quite a bit with this weapon, so we're almost, we're basically going to be getting a 20% flat damage increase on this weapon. For the handgun, I really recommend using Enigma. Again, I really like to use uh, elemental damage weapons, and not only that, but just the nature of how Enigma works. Even after the nerfs that it got, it is extremely good at killing multiple targets, which can be really helpful on a number of bosses, including Annihilation, which can be a big headache for a lot of players. And in the mutator slot, I like to run harmonizer so that we are able to get some mod power back on our main weapon. Now, when we take a look at our jewelry slots, what I have set up here is the typical, I'll call it the typical boss killer uh, setup. So we're running full moon circlet, range damage, life steals, 3% base damage dealt at full health, range damage is increased by 20%. So by nature of the way that we're going to be using Resonating Heart, we're going to have almost 100% uptime on that 20% range damage, which is fantastic. In our first ring slot, I like to use Stone of Malevolence, although this one is really open to whatever you like to use. If you're not using elemental damage, it's going to be completely worthless to you, use something that you think would work better. But for my case, elemental damage generates 15% additional mod power. And basically, since I am doing so much elemental damage, I'm gonna be recharging a lot of mod power using this. In the second ring slot, we're going with Ring of Omens. Our evade is going to cost 14% of our max health as gray health instead of stamina. So we're not gonna to have to worry about stamina at all. And with the way that we are going to be regenerating our gray health and with the way it works with resonating heart, we're going to be regening health as well to get more relics. Not only that, but when we use this in conjunction with something like the full moon circlet, it's going to be giving us misty step, which is the best version of dodge that we can get. And I find it very helpful for learning boss fights. The next ring on our list is Soul Guard. This is kind of a requirement for this build. We're going to gain a stack of Bulwark for each active summon. This is going to give us just that much more damage mitigation since we're going to be having our summons up basically 100% of the time. And our last ring slot, we're using the Blessed Ring. After receiving the benefits of a relic, we're going to gain two stacks of Bulwark for 15 seconds. So because of the way our relic works, we're going to be popping that quite a bit. So we're going to have nearly 100% uptime on that bulwark, which again, like I said, we're going to have 100% uptime on our other two stacks of bulwark. Thanks to our pets, not really going to, our pets really aren't going to be able to die. So effectively, we are going to have four stacks of bulwark at any given time. Now, it should be noted that especially during Apocalypse difficulty playthroughs, there is not a one-size-fits-all build. I highly recommend playing around with different builds if you get stuck in a certain area. This is just the framework that I use for any given encounter. Any given boss encounter, I should say. Now, when it comes to clearing trash, the amount of damage mitigation we have here is super overkill. We don't need this much. Hell, we don't even really need the Misty Step. So honestly, what I like to do when clearing trash, you guys know me, I like to switch it up to the Toxic Release Valve. This is so helpful during your trash clears. It will nearly one-shot most of the smaller enemies that are going to come our way. Not only that, but it is also going to put a Corrosive Dot, which that will finish off most enemies. It's also going to count towards our Stone of Malevolence in that it's going to be generating uh, mod damage or mod power for us. And in the ring slot here, when we're clearing trash, I like to switch out the Blessed Ring for the Alumni Ring so that we can be doing a little bit more elemental damage. 
Now again, not every encounter is going to work very well with this spec. For example, if you come across a boss encounter that has resistance to elemental damage, this is going to be a terrible, terrible build for you. So consider switching it out to maybe something like a bleed, uh, more bleed centric spec. Really the point I'm trying to get across is use this as a framework and build around it, experiment with it. The real point of this spec, as I've said a few times already, is to get you better at the game. If you're just sitting there face tanking everything with Crystal Heart, that's perfectly fine if that's the way you want to play the game. But in my experience, it doesn't make you better at boss encounters. I feel like I started getting a lot better at them when I was using this build because I was trying my very best to not get hit by stuff. And when we have things like the Misty Step helping us out, we get much, much better. Anyway, that's just my two cents on the philosophy behind this build. You can take it for what you will. If you think it's garbage and you don't want to use it, then by all means, uh, you can definitely use um, Crystal Heart to tank every shot in the game. That's perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with that. All right, so let's move on. Let's take a look at the traits that I'm using here. I like to go 10 points into Fortify to get us 50% more armor effectiveness. Uh, of course, we're going to be getting 10 points of regrowth and triage based on our archetypes. I like to finish off by putting the full 10 points into Vigor. It's basically a requirement that we're going to be running 10 points in Blood Bond and 10 points in Rugged. And I would also highly recommend putting 10 points into Shade Skin. Where you have a little bit of wiggle room, I like to put 10 points into Bloodstream, but you don't have to. And I also put 7 points in Bark Skin. Uh, that last 17 points, you can really put it wherever you like. Um, I'm sure people will say that putting it into Bark Skin is overkill, but that's just where I put it. You can put it wherever you like. Uh, fitness would be good. Footwork. Swiftness is a great choice. Or even... Uh, untouchable. All right, guys, that's going to do it for today's video. Uh, I'm going to leave in the background my playthrough of Yesha on Apocalypse difficulty so you guys can see the build in action. Um, but if you found this video helpful or entertaining, hopefully I've earned your subscription. But until then, I will see you guys next time. Have yourselves a good one.
music out here. Oh, Bakute. We must speak again. Okay, this is it.
looking good.
Yeah. 